abortion a nation in crisis. This year we received a constant daily barrage of figures on the news. How many people have caught corner coronavirus? How many are in hospital or have died? Years ago there would have been a large amount of frightening infectious diseases around and without antibiotics and vaccines many would have been fatal. People died far younger and infant mortality was much higher. In fact the sort of country we live in today would have seemed something wonderful to aspire to, something to dream and hope for. Yet, what does our society do? We turn on our most vulnerable. Now here we are on the eve of the 53rd anniversary of legalised abortion in the UK commemorating over the loss of 9 million lives. Lives purposely destroyed and as many women and families permanently damaged. Indeed, since the Abortion Act was passed on the 27th of October 1967 and implemented in April 68, the figures in the UK for abortions in the first six months of this year have been the highest ever. Yet the standard of care for women has reached a new low. Even the World Health Organization, who cynically advocate abortion as the right of every woman, say that an abortion is unsafe when it is carried out either by a person lacking the necessary skills or in an environment that does not conform to minimal medical standards or both. So why has this country deemed it acceptable to allow women to have DIY home abortions alone from which two women have already died. It also states that every individual has the right to decide without discrimination, coercion and violence. The number, spacing and timing of their children. Those individual rights obviously don't extend to fathers who desperately want to keep a baby their wife or partner aborts, or to women who feel bullied and threatened to have an abortion by partners or husbands and coerced by family. Volunteers outside abortion clinics have provided a lifeline to women such as this and those in other distressing situations through conversation, practical help, leaflets and prayer. But this is now under threat, as under the false guise of care and concern. Other groups are joining with abortion providers in the call for buffer zones, which will prevent these volunteers from standing anywhere near the entrance. These buffer zones have already happened at three UK clinics, two in London and more recently one in Manchester. Abortion providers have written to the current Home Secretary, Priti Patel, even though the previous Home Secretary said there was no need for any new legislation as laws in place were all perfectly, already perfectly adequate. Those who have signed the letter include the BMA, British Medical Association, RCOM, Royal College of Midwives, Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists, Women's Aid, Fatherhood Institute, Mumsnet, Doctors for Choice, and most ironically of all, from End Violence Against Women. At the same time, alar alarmingly, there is a push to decriminalise abortion altogether, effectively making it legal on demand up to birth. Yet it is sometimes said that the darkest hour is before the dawn. There is great hope emerging out of these grim realities. This year there has been more people involved in grassroots pro-life work than ever before in the UK, including the highest number of 40 Days for Life campaigns. This year, online, online March for Life event, Life Fest, 
had over 15,000 people turning in. If the volunteers for 40 Days for Life and other groups who minister outside abortion facilities were not making a significant impact on abortion industry, when then why would the abortion centres be so desperate to get buffer zones? If they were not impacting the people they speak to, especially in those last moments of the abortion centres, then why has there been such a huge increase in demand for the abortion reversal pill, which more doctors than ever helping women procure this? And if the information, conversations and prayers with and for men and women were not touching their hearts, then why are we most post abortive women than at any other time accessing Rachel's Vineyard retreats, offering real care, support and healing to men and women struggling, struggling to come to terms with their abortion experience? There is a change happening and the tide is turning. Prayer, of course, can never be stopped. And the work of every individual can, does and will make a difference. How heartening to see the wonderful campaign from Heidi Crowther, a recently married young woman with Down's syndrome, who is challenging the law regarding abortion up to birth for people with Down syndrome. She is an amazing example to everyone and with 90% of pregnancies with Down syndrome children now ending in abortion in this country, it is a tragedy that people with such value are so often not treasured. It is absolutely right that we should feel a just and righteous anger at the figures involved where abortion is concerned over the last 53 years. But the words of the 4th century philosopher, theologian and Catholic saint Augustine of Hippo, Hope has two daughters, he said. Their names are anger and courage. Anger at the way things are and courage to see that they do not remain the way they are. God bless you all.